Well, it's good to see everybody this morning. Looking forward to uh, when everybody gets healed up and can come and join us and it'll be a great day. Tuesday night, the mm -hmm. Bible study. I was just going to mention that. The Bible study on Tuesday night, if you didn't get to come this week, or this past week, come this week. Uh, uh, it's it's just incredible. That, that man can teach the Word of God. He's, he's, he's very good. And the Word of God, of course, is all awesome. So... It's uh, been, uh, it was good, and we're continuing on this week uh, on, at 7 o'clock on Tuesday, and we're not having a Wednesday night, we're just having the Tuesday night. Although we've got to get together on these uh, shoe boxes and get everybody here that can do it and uh, have a day of trying to get those packed up so we can do it. We've got some time, but we need to be thinking about it anyway. <coughs> Now we're going to be in Joel, uh, and I could say it's the book right after Hosea, <laughs> but uh, you may not even know where Hosea is, but it's right after Daniel, Daniel, Hosea, and Joel, and that's a uh, prophetic book, it's one of the minor prophets, uh, he was one of the minor prophets, and it's not that it's not important, it's just shorter than some of the others. And, uh, and so we're going to look in it, because something struck me from the thing Tuesday, and, um, and God just uh, gave me this uh, message from that. Let's have prayer, though, before we start. Lord, thank you today for your goodness to us. Uh, we don't deserve it most of the time. We, we just uh, praise you for it, though. Your kindness and your grace and your mercy and all the things that you do for us that keep us moving, uh, keep us uh, existing uh, in this life uh, to live uh, for the day to come and everlasting life. We thank you for meeting every need, uh, even ones we don't know about. Father, we just praise you, and we ask that you'd be with us, and again, bless those that couldn't be here today. Lift them up. Maybe give us some more people on Tuesday, maybe some others, some have said something to others, and there'll be more people here. It's a, it's a study that needs to be done, and people need to take heed to it. And Father, we praise you for what you'll do. We ask you to bless us now in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Uh, this, is, uh, this message is called the day of the Lord. Uh, he mentioned that. And the day of the Lord has been considered many times. Uh, uh, a lot of people don't know exactly what it means. They try to put it in a box, but you can't put it in a box. Because nobody knows that day. But the day of the Lord is a specific period of time, not a 24-hour day uh, necessarily, when God will bring judgment upon the earth. So the day of the Lord is a day of, uh, or a period of time that brings when God will judge uh, the people of earth in the end times. Um, no one but the Father knows that time. The characteristics of people uh, <coughs> well, hold your finger where you are and go back to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. Now this, this tells you what kind of time it will be and when we read this you'll, you'll realize that we're talking about uh, any time, just uh, any old time God wants to uh, say the word, Jesus will come and get his church, and then we'll begin the seven-year tribulation. The first half of it, three and a half years will be the tribulation, and the second half of it, the three and a half years, will be the great tribulation. 
Now in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, it says this. Where am I? Here we go. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, if that doesn't describe today, I don't know what does. And God, shortly after that, destroyed the whole world by flood. That's at the time of Noah. And uh, now here we find ourselves in this kind of condition in the world today and in America where we never thought we'd see it. I'm going to quit talking about it so much, though, uh, because it is what it is, and we need to deal with it and, and uh, turn back to God. And uh, just prior uh, uh, to the uh, flood, the destroying uh, of the world by the flood, this, this verse was written. Now, go over to Revelation chapter 6. I don't want to get into Revelation because we're studying that, and I... I want uh, it to be uh, a specific study. But I do want to read you a couple of verses here to make a point about this. In Revelation chapter 6 and verse 17, it says, For great, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Then if you would look at chapter 16 and verse 14 of Revelation, Chapter 16 and verse 14, it starts, you start to get the idea. Chapter 16 and verse 14, it says, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle, to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. The day of the Lord will be a day, a day of judgment. And it will be a day of, of battle. And Armageddon will be part of it. And so we see then that uh, this specific period of time, uh, well, first of all, nothing has to be done before the rapture of the church. Everything that had to be done uh, for Jesus to come back and rapture the church has been done. So we're just waiting. We're waiting for that day. And, and as uh, 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 Pastor Jeffress said on Tuesday when we were watching, he said he could do it before we're finished. That day could come, that period of time could begin anytime. Anytime now. So uh, not the exact end, but the beginning of it. Now, in verse 9 of Joel, uh, chapter 2, it says, speaking of this time, it says, they shall run uh, to and fro in the city. Now, that city would be Jerusalem, wouldn't it? Because that's where the focus of uh, the end times is. It's in the Middle East. And... Uh, It'll be all over the world, but uh, the focus of it will be the end times in the Middle East where the Antichrist will be, uh, who tries to take the place of Jesus, and he enters into the temple uh, by his flattering speech and by his uh, promises uh, of peace, and then at the three and a half year period, he will renege and he will demand that people fall down and worship him and take the mark of the beast. And if a person does not take the mark of the beast, uh, then he would, that person would lose his life. Basically, he would starve to death, most likely, because it would end all, he wouldn't be able to buy or sell any goods. All right, now, he says, they shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Well, you know, uh, that, that uh, 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 really is applicable because uh, Satan is a thief. 
Uh, if, if you looked at John 10, uh, he says that, uh, uh, that he is, uh, comes as uh, one who steals and kills and destroys. And he is a, a thief uh, from the very beginning, a deceiver, that old serpent, and on and on it goes. Now, what does this part, first part of this mean? Well, there'll be bedlam in the streets. We're already seeing that, see, the preceder to that, uh, to that time of coming time is uh, already on us. And even though we haven't been raptured out, uh, we are experiencing some of that, not to the degree of this, believe me, but we're beginning to see it happening. Uh, people running wild in the streets. We saw it first in, uh, in the 1960s when Satan started to really establish his seat uh, in America, and uh, we saw that. And I believe at that time his, his, the seat of his uh, kingdom his earthly kingdom was in uh, uh, San Francisco, California, uh, at a hate Ashbury Street. That's where the the uh, high priest of the first church of Satan was at that time. I think he's dead and in hell now. The man that was the high priest, Anton Levey, was the man's name. Now let's look at Matthew because this gives us a little more insight to this time. This time is coming and we need to be ready for it. That's why we're teaching the uh, uh, entertaining people to come and, and learn uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, Revelation what this all means. In Matthew chapter 24 verse 6 it says, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Does that apply today? That's applied for a long time, isn't it? That's nothing new. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Well, we see that. We've got wars going on and wars are going on, and, and they continue to happen. But the end isn't yet, but the start of the end is now. It is here. Verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places, or diverse places. Uh, in verse 8, it says, All these are the beginning of sorrows. So we're already seeing these things to start to, uh, to happen, and the culmination of uh, a lot of things that have gone on in the world for the last uh, 2,000 years since Jesus ascended into heaven. And uh, that's not a very long period of time. It sounds like a long period of time, but it's not when you look at it from the eyes and see it from the eyes of, of God. Basically two days. Now in verses uh, 12, it says, And because iniquity shall abound... Now, iniquity is sin, but iniquity, it is sin, but it's a, it's a, a very uh, uh, severe type of sin. And we're seeing that too because sin has become, even the worst of sin has become commonplace in the world today. Homosexuality and, and, uh, uh, and other a perverted uh, sexual lifestyles, and then uh, also uh, uh, the maliciousness of people, the out and out hatred for people. And, uh, and this verse says in 12, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. It's getting so evil in the world today that it's hard for people to love one another. And it's hard for even Christians to have love for people. And I taught a lesson on bitterness. I think it was last week. And one of the things that, that bitterness comes from or, or, or that these things come from is from the uh, lack of love for people. 
And I see Christians that are struggling with this in their lives today. And so we see that these things are beginning to culminate. Verse 15, When you therefore see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. The, uh, the abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist will declare himself to be Christ, Jesus Christ, and he will uh, take over the temple and he will demand that people fall down and worship him and to take the number of the beast and give themselves over themselves over to him. Now, this is a time to come. This will come at the three and a half year point of the seven year tribulation. Now in verse 21 we see, For then shall be great tribulation. There it is. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. In other words, this time that's coming will be the worst time in the history of the world. Even that group back in uh, Genesis 6-5, just before Noah, and God destroyed the world because of their sin, because of their activities and their lack of uh, godliness, he, he, killed, he killed everybody except eight people. And this is worse. This time will be worse. And so we see it. Verse 22, he says, And except those days be shortened, there should be no flesh or no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now when he says saved there, he can mean uh, uh, saved uh, uh, eternally. But basically he's talking about saved physically. Well, if you die without Jesus Christ, it means both. Amen? If you, if you die, if a person dies before they've had a chance to or took advantage of the opportunity to know Jesus Christ and just figured this was going to go on, this world would just continue to go on, well, I tell you, the world needs to wake up because it's not going to happen. And if he, hasn't, if he doesn't shorten the days... Many, many, many people will lose not only their physical lives, but their spiritual lives. In fact, they will lose their spiritual lives. Many of them will. Now, verse 29, it says this. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, now we've passed through the seven year tribulation. Um, Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. And, uh, um, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of, heavens, of the heavens uh, shall be shaken. The very foundation of, a, of this world we live in will be shaken. Uh, in verse 30, it says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. You see, when we see Jesus coming at the tribulation, I mean at the uh, uh, rapture, it will be a glorious day for us because He'll be coming to get us and we will be shed of all this nonsense of the world. Amen. And we'll go home with Him. We'll come back. And, but we'll be with Him throughout all eternity. Unending. But when the people of the world at the end of the tribulation and they see at the battle of Armageddon, they see Jesus coming. They will mourn and weep.
People will run wildly, mindlessly, seeking some way to escape Jesus. They won't be glad to see Jesus. They'll be sorrowful. And they will be full of sorrow. For the day of the Lord will bring judgment to those who had rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now verse 10 back in Joel. Verse 10. It says, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Well, one scripture we read there in Matthew that said that the stars will fall from heaven. So there will be a lot of things. Uh, you know, I was watching... Uh, uh, what is it? The Smithsonian uh, Channel. I was watching... Uh, what do I like? What's Aerial that? America. Yeah, Aerial America. Uh, it's where they fly over and they tell you about different places. It's really fun. It's a great, great show. Uh, and uh, they showed uh, this big crater out in Arizona. It's 15, no, 18 miles across. That's how big this crater is. And they said, well, it was hit by a, uh, a meteor. And uh, it's, uh, I think they said it's about five miles deep. No, not five miles, 500, 500 feet deep. And about 18 miles across. It's quite a sight. And if you can imagine this, some of the stars and meteors and other things falling from the sky. One account in the Bible tells us that there at one period of time there will be hailstones that weigh a hundred pounds falling from the sky. And people will be running wild, just mindless, trying to, with fear. We talked about fear this morning. Well, they'll have fear because they won't have God. And when they start, these things start happening, there will be great fear. And the... Uh, Sun and moon will be dark and the stars will quit shining and it'll be a very scary time for those who do not have Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now, the book of Joel is written to who? Christians. No, it's not. No. No. Christians, you say? No, it's not. It's written to <coughs> Jews. It means the Old Testament is written to Jews. But there are principles in these Old Testament books that apply to everybody, even in this day and age we live in. Now, if this book is written to Jews and Gentiles. And will anybody be saved in that time? Well, there's the 144,000 uh, witnesses and the two witnesses, and there's others, so uh, there is indication that some will uh, maybe see receive Christ. But after we get into the great after the great tribulation, in fact, I think after the mid tribulation, that it'd be pretty much over for people to be saved. They might, if they do, they have to give up their life for it. If they enter into that and they do not take the mark of the beast as the great tribulation begins, then they'll, they'll have to uh, endure all that and they'll be lost, uh, most likely. Now verse, uh, verse 11, and Joel says this, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide in it? The Lord is strong 
in fulfilling His Word. I don't know anything, and I've studied for years, not looking for this, but just in recollection. There's not one thing in the Word of God that, that He has promised that He has not fulfilled, except the things that are yet to be fulfilled. But nothing is passed by that should have been fulfilled and wasn't. Uh, he promised us uh, everlasting life. Well, we haven't reached that point yet. But really, if you think about it, we've already started it because we're saved. And so we're living life and we're going to continue to live life even if we die because all we do is trade places, just change our existence. Isn't that a great thing? Yes, it, is. it is. We just go home. I'm looking forward to going home. Uh, oh, I I love my family and and uh, my friends and church and so forth. And I love to do work for the Lord. But you know, I'm looking forward to being in His presence and being there in heaven. Now. He fulfills His word, and the day the day of the Lord is great in its uh, reviling of God. It says it's great, but now that doesn't mean that it's good. Uh, but it is uh, it is great uh, in those uh, that revile God against those that revile God, and very terrible in its judgment. The judgment in that in that time is not the end times judgment yet. But the day of the Lord is the judgment of, let's say, Armageddon. When Jesus will return and, and with the voice of His word, with His voice, He will slay the nations and millions that had gathered there to battle the Antichrist will turn their eyes on Jesus coming and this is when they will realize they are lost. And it will be a terrible day for them. I, I, I hate to think about people who would see that day in that state and wonder what was going to happen. Well, he was going to slay them. Chapter 14 of Revelation when Dr. Jeffries gets, Jeffries gets to it and also uh, chapter 19. And he'll slay them with the voice of his mouth. He could say, you're dead. And they'd break open. And the blood will run for 200 miles. Blood will be horse, horse bridle deep at four feet. Basically, for 184 miles, technically, but everybody says 200 miles. And I'm, I'm glad I'm not going to be there. Well, I, I'll be coming back with him. So will you, if you know Jesus Christ. Anybody here ever owned a white horse? Anybody? Yeah. Have you? Yeah. Well, you're going to have another one. On that day, if you know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, You'll be on that horse. You'll be his army. And you'll come and he will do the work. He will slay the nations. But we will take up positions of importance to govern the millennial kingdom. And we'll be on white horses. That's what it says. Well, I've never had one. Had a great one, though. Didn't have it. My dad did, didn't he? Old Betsy. Old, 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 Old Betsy, yeah. All right, so... That's the kind of thing. And then it says, who can abide? Or who can live through the day of the Lord? Nobody. Nobody that he doesn't allow. And he will keep a remnant. You know, God always keeps a remnant. remnant. And they are the elect of God. The Jews are. We're elect also. But they are elect because uh, they were a nation and we're a nation, but we're a nation of individuals. We are, we're not a nation with a, 
uh, with a nationality. We, we have all kinds of nationalities in our nation. There's only three nations, Jew, Gentile, and the saved, the Christian. We're a nation of Christians. Now verse 12, and we won't be here. Well, we'll be here, but we won't be involved in the judgment. Now verse 12 says, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn you even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. This is an important verse. And what he is saying is that uh, the Lord gives some consolation, particularly to the Jews uh, and uh, Gentiles living now. Now, this is the day of God's consolation. This is the day that God has given everybody an opportunity to be saved. And he says uh, that he will give consolation, particularly to the Jews and to Gentiles. Uh, we've received the consolation of God, have we not? We've received the pity. We've received the goodness of God. The greatest things of God, we've received them through our salvation. You can't have anything better than salvation. Anything less than salvation is destruction. And that's what that day will be. And he says, turn you even to me with all your heart. And I know there's people today that have turned to Jesus in a way. They, they, they want the benefits of Jesus. In fact, I preached a message here once, I think, called Everybody Wants a Savior, but Nobody Wants a Lord. You know, we want to have Jesus saving grace through faith, but we don't want to have Jesus as Lord. Many Christians don't. I'm not saying us particularly. I'm saying many Christians don't. They just want the good things of God, but they don't want the other things that it takes to be used of God. They don't want to be putting, they're putting themselves in subjection to the Lord. Before it's too late, before the day of the Lord, and to Jews at the time of the day of the Lord, he is saying, turn with fasting. Now, what does fasting mean to you? It means the restriction of something, doesn't it? Yeah. It means you're getting down to business. You're serious about what you're doing. That's exactly what it means. Fasting, we look at it as uh, depriving ourselves of food and drink for a period of time. But not just to do that, it's a period of time where we face ourselves and turn back to God in the ways that He shows us we need to. And everybody needs to be in the fellowship with Christ. Now that's something you can live in. You can abide in Christ. But nobody will abide in this. Nobody. That he doesn't allow. So fasting means true seriousness about your sin. Uh, with weeping. He's saying here to everybody to turn in their sorrow and mourning as to their eternal condition before God. The day of heart reckoning is upon them. That day, they will understand all those who have rejected and rejected and rejected. They'll understand. Now, this is why we should be broken hearted. Because if we're believers, we should care enough about the world that we want to see as many as can be saved as we can. We need to take our uh, resources, our money, our, our things that we have, and 
we should think about the way we can use those things to get people to turn and to see themselves as they are and what they need and who they need to turn to so that they won't face that day. My brother was one day from facing that day. One day. I went there, I ministered to him several times then. And donned him. And he refused, he refused, he refused. When I went over, they told they called me and said, You better come over here. I went over, that was on a Friday, I think it was. And I gave him the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I said, Do you want to pray and accept Jesus? And he he, he said, No. And I said, Well, I tell you what. You think about what I've said to you today. And I'll be back tomorrow. And you tell me what your decision is. If you would. But I really want you to tell Jesus what your decision is. So I went back on Saturday. Sure enough, I showed up. And I walked in and I said, Did you think about and pray about what I said to you yesterday? And he shook his head because by that time he couldn't talk. He shook his head and I said, did you make a decision to accept Jesus? And he shook his head, yes. He died the next day, didn't he? Yeah, the next day he died. One day was the difference. You think about people facing that and we think, don't we think, that we got plenty of time. Isn't one of Satan's biggest uh, uh, insidious uh, workings in the world is that you have more time? Oh, that's not going to happen today. You go ahead, live like you want to, the world thinks. And when you're ready to get saved, you can get saved. No, you won't. Because it takes the Spirit of God. And God may have removed his spiritual work in your life, a person's life. So, verse 13, it says, And rend or tear your heart, not your clothing, but your heart, as a person who re reviles his own ungodliness. Have you, ever hate, have you ever done something and you hated it because you did it? Oh, I've got, I got a list. I could roll out a scroll, probably. And I've done things that I look back on and, boy, I'm so repentant and so sorry I've done those things. And he uh, is saying here that to, uh, to revive the ungodliness and unrighteousness and pour out your soul as David did in Psalm 51. I want you to turn to Psalm real quick. I'll be through in just a minute. I tried to chop this down, but it's hard to do sometimes. All right, in uh, Psalm uh, 51, verses 1 through 3, it says, David said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, Blot out my transgressions. Blot out my sin. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from all sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Here's what I encourage you to do when you get home. Take the time to get your Bible out and read the 51st Psalm. Because in it are the, are the contrition of the heart of verses that tell how we should feel and should do under our Lord. And why? Because who knows if through the honesty with God a person's repentance honesty with God and repenting toward God. Maybe you have somebody you can talk to 
about that because they need God in their life. And you have to show them this and say, you know, this is what it takes. It takes a true belief in Jesus Christ. And pour out that. And who knows uh, that through a person's repentance, whether God will show grace, mercy, kindness, and cessation of judgment toward that person. Grace to be saved at that time. Maybe somebody will be hell withheld from that day of the Lord because of something you can do that will lead them to Christ. God may even change his mind to destroy that person by allowing them to be saved. By giving him or, that or, or her the Spirit of God in their heart. Grace, the giving of the Spirit, the divinity that comes into us through faith. You cannot have it. You cannot have grace, the indwelling Spirit, and the work of the Spirit, and everlasting life, unless you have faith. And God will give you the faith to believe. If you'll desire it. He will show you how you can believe. And bless those who repent. And ask forgiveness. With a true heart. Well. I had some more. There's some principles in here. But. Um, I may do some more. And I may continue this next week. Uh, if not I'll make you something that you can have. I don't want to uh, go any further today. But I will have you something that will finish that off and have another message or I will increase this and finish it off next week. Anybody got something you'd like to share? Alright, let's pray. Father, thank you today for your goodness to us. Wow, Lord, I just think about my life. And when I think about my life, I shudder. I lived my life in fear. That was about the Sunday school lesson this morning. I was afraid because I couldn't control certain things. And I was a controlling type of person. If I couldn't control it, I was afraid of it. But God showed me that I don't need to be controlling. I just need to let him have control. Because he does a better job than I do with my life and with anybody's life. Help us to let him have control. And Father, give us some principles next week on this that will be good for us to use in life. Father, we'll praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.